Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Principal Program Manager of the Cloud and Enterprise Group, Scott Hanselman. Hi, friends. I know, hi. I know it has been a, a long day. There's a lot of information here. It's extremely overwhelming and sometimes hard to process. Let's try to put some of this stuff into context. I know that we have a lot of demos. I've got a lot of demos. But what I want you to understand is the power that this all gives us as developers. This sense of, uh, I can do that. I can build this. I can see how that snaps into this. You can look at all of this as being a, a parade of demos, but for me, I look at it as this kind of cafeteria of all these wonderful things that I want to try and I want to plug together. So I've brought you a whole series of demos that are very personal to me about not just stuff you could create, but stuff that has been created, that has been created with the technologies that give us superpowers. Now, it is also important to note that one size does not fit all, and that's one of the things that makes me happy about working on Azure and working on ASP.NET, is that whether it be tiny shared virtual machines and small websites that I do on the side on a hobby, or whether it be super large machine learning type systems that can put together the power of thousands and thousands of processors, I can go and do that. I can run Raspberry Pi code, and I can run massive analytical systems in the cloud. Uh, the cloud that is Azure allows us to do all of that kind of stuff. And what I like about it and why I still work here and why it makes me so happy is because it Are we still there? We lost our battery there. This, uh, this microphone is not powered by the cloud. <laughs> so we lost that there for a second. It's all good. Uh, is, it is an open and flexible cloud. It is a cloud that lets us use the technologies that make us happy. If you want to use Puppet, you want to use Chef, you want to use Mesos, you want to use Linux, use what makes you happy. And that, for me, means enjoyable development. And I like to see these pieces all dropping together because now I can build things the way that make me happy. And I, I put that in there. I said enjoyable development, happy development. I want that feeling even when I'm by myself where I can accomplish something and go, yeah, look, that was, there's no one else here, but look, I did it, it was amazing. That sense of power is why we continue to do this. So I'm gonna show you some of the great stuff that we've built and uh, some of the tools that we get to, uh, to use. Now, here we are. Uh, I wanted to point out briefly that if you go to get.asp.net, so getasp.net, you can go up there and that's your acquisition point. That's where you go to get ASP.NET. You can get ASP.NET 4.6. You can use web forms. This is the ASP.NET that you know and love and you can install that for Windows today. You can also go and get ASP.NET 5 RC that runs on the .NET Core. And when you hit this website, right now I hit it on a Windows machine, so it says install for Windows. But if you go and hit it on a Linux machine, it'll say install for Linux. And if you hit it on an iPhone, it'll say view source. And then you can go off and look at the source for .NET. This is where you go to get these things. Now this application that I'm running right here, I uh, am going to uh, add some open source software to it. Now this is uh, an open source bit of software called Glimpse. Some of you who are web developers may be familiar with things like uh, F12 tools, right? And when you are inside of uh, your system and you are doing debugging, you're gonna go and set up F12 tools to see your JavaScript. And then you saw earlier we had uh, application insights to do production time debugging. But there's a middle ground where uh, people need a different experience. So this tool glimpse is going to inject itself into ASP.NET. We're going to bring up our uh, public website that we brought up before. And I want you to look in the lower right-hand corner there. Look at that. This is giving me insights. This is actually a little bit of JavaScript that's injected a dashboard into my application and I can see how long the database took. I can see what time was spent on the client, what time was spent on the server. This is that bridge between what you see in F12 tools and what you see in some deep analytics. I can even go and hit, let's hit some database work here. Here we've just hit some database. Glimpse pops up. It tells me how much time was spent on the database, but let's even go farther. Let's dig in. Let's see what the database query was, exactly how much time was spent on the network. Tools like this are what make me 
enjoy ASP.NET so much. This is actually an open source project. We had the gentleman that worked on this join our team and plug this in. So now you've got an experience where you've got F12 tools in your browser, you've got Glimpse bridging browser and server, and you've got application insights when it's time to go to production. This stuff is really, really fun. Now if I go over into uh, Azure right now and look at App Insights for this website, we'll click on this, we can see the application health, see things like server response time, how long the browser page took to load. Again, a bridge between the JavaScript, the client side, and the server side coming into one single view. Now this is an application view because this app runs in the web. Sometimes you'll have applications that run in virtual machines. You'll have like a legacy app and virtual machines run anything that you want. Uh, and when things go wrong, it can be a little bit challenging to diagnose because it may not have been an application error in the website. It may have been somewhere else in the virtual machine. This is uh, Azure Diagnostics that allows me to look at the failures in this legacy application. So here's some failed requests. You can see the different requests. I can see that we have an exception here. You can see exactly when they happen. I'm going to pick one of these exceptions and see what's going on. And it's interesting because I'm seeing JavaScript on the client. So that says that something went wrong in the browser. But that might be an echo of something that happened on the server. So what I really want to do is I want to look at the telemetry before and after this moment and see if there's something nearby the smoking gun. So here, I can see five minutes before and five minutes after. I can see that we're processing tracing data here, 10%. And then suddenly I can see both an exception within a .NET application or even go down into unmanaged code. Click on that and get the details that I'm going to need to solve that problem. When these things go wrong, I'll get an email. And I can go directly to that from the email. So I got a notification that this went wrong. I can go and say click on the application portal and go right to it. So you're getting a, a full life cycle there. Uh, to debug the issue that you, uh, that you might have. Let's switch over to the slides here for a moment. So we hear a lot about virtual machines and websites, and it can be a little overwhelming because there's a lot of acronyms. There's IaaS and PaaS, and there's all these TLAs, right, these three-letter acronyms. I like to look at it like this. There's virtual machines that you own, you manage. You make one, you own it. It's like a puppy. You have to keep it alive. You are now responsible for this virtual machine. You have to run Windows Update on the puppy. Uh, websites, you don't have to worry about those things. The operating system handles it for you. Now, there is this middle ground where you have these stateless virtual machines where Azure manages the update and you have still full power. So that's a nice place that sits between platform as a service and infrastructure as a service, PaaS and IaaS. There's also this new thing called service fabric because sometimes when you model large object-oriented systems, you can't just go and make a million of some kind of an object and have them all have state. And that's why we keep oscillating as a industry between object-oriented and service-oriented, and we're going back and forth about what the right thing to do is. Sometimes it's just nice to model a million of something and have those million objects have state. But you also want to deal with the life cycle management of those objects. But then you have to think about versioning. These stateful services, these microservices, are what we want to write, but it's hard. Service fabric allows you to do that. And uh, one of the ways that I like to look at it is platform as a service is kind of like uh, you know, a hotel room, like the one that I thrashed uh, down, down the street because I'm a rock star. And uh, I don't have to worry about it because it's platform as a service. Someone's going to put that back together. Unlike the virtual machine, which is my home, where I have to go home after this and clean the gutters because I am responsible for that space. Service fabric is kind of like those little Japanese capsule hotels where there's just a little bit of space, it's very stateful and it's handled for you, but you don't worry about the larger system. You just do your job. You sleep and then you leave the capsule hotel. So it's kind of like you know, renting a small room. You get many things. You get lifecycle management. I'll show you what that means. We'll give you some demos here. You get independent scaling. You get updates. And it's the updates that are so crazy because once you go and deploy something, what if you want to go and update it? Do you have to bring the system down again? but you're managing all this state. How do you deal with that? It's also important to point out that Service Fabric can run on Windows in Azure 
or on another cloud. If you want to run it on Windows in Amazon, you can do that. And in the future, perhaps on Linux or in a hosted cloud. It's totally up to you. So let's see an interesting example of what the fabric can do. And uh, we had talked about uh, how it's a, this is a health clinic, right? And we've got all of this IoT data that's flowing in. I've actually got a, a band on, and we're going to pretend that there are people with bands on out there in the world. So we've got hundreds of thousands of bands all providing data, and they're flowing that into the fabric. This is all real. This is, in fact, running on 40 virtual machines. And in this case here, it is modeling 100,000 bands, and it's going to continue to add bands to this system. Now, I wrote an algorithm to express the stress level of the people. Just want to get a sense of America's stress. Unfortunately, I did a lousy job, and I only made three like stops. It's like black, which is not stressed, uh, green, which is like medium stress, and high, which is like either stressed or dead. Um, <laughs> but it didn't make a very attractive uh, map here. But the system is working. How do I upgrade this system with 10 million health reports and 100,000 bands all at the same time? What I want to do is take this system and upgrade it. I made some changes here. This is where we send the health report and where the doctor gets the health report back from the band. In fact, the doctors are what they call actors in the actor model. And each doctor is an object. So we're really talking about 100,000 bands, objects, and 50,000 doctors across 40 virtual machines. What I'm going to do is I'm going to go and publish this. And I have uh, enabled this. Uh, configuration, I plugged the configuration of the surface fabric into my system. So I actually made a new algorithm that I'm going to call new algo. I made it in code, but I'm going to make this change as a configuration object. And I'm going to just bump the version of this. And I want to point out again, each object is a real thing, like doctors are something and bands are something. There's hundreds of thousands of objects running right now. And I'm going to hit publish. And you have to think about this from a, a, a different layer of abstraction. Before, I sent a single website to a single Docker container. Here, I'm thinking about this business object, this band, or this doctor. And I'm going to send that out to 40 virtual machines. But I don't really want to worry about 40 virtual machines, do I, right? I want to worry about uh, the business problem, the higher level of abstraction. I want to be able to go into an explorer like this and see these are the apps. They run on n number of machines. I don't really know how many machines, as many as is needed. And when we see the upgrade starting, you see that the current version, here we go, upgrade progress. What we're going to see as the upgrade proceeds is the objects actually update in production. So right now, there's a moment where part of the objects are version 1, and the other one's on version 1.0.1. And that is rolling out throughout the entire thing while we still make new objects. So we're, we're actually modeling, in this case, already 11 million health reports from bands across 110,000 doctors. And this application continues to roll forward to this new version. So this is a higher level of abstraction that we can, we can think about. And it's enabling a whole new class. This is absolutely real, 40 virtual machines updating all in Azure. Cool. I know it'll take a minute for that to soak in. It's OK. I don't feel bad. No, no, that's OK. So, so let's talk about this. That's a pretty cool map. A lot of amazing stuff happened. Uh, you know, that's, that's, that's amazing. But what, what did we actually solve? OK? So this models these Internet of Things objects. I've actually got a couple of devices plugged into me. Right now, I've got this band. This is real, and it's modeling my, uh, it's looking at my heart rate. But I'm also a type 1 diabetic, and I've been diabetic for 20 years. And one of the things that every diabetic does when they become diabetic is they try to solve this problem, usually with Microsoft Excel. But at some point, they try to figure out, well, I'm diabetic, and I'm an engineer. Let's plug some wires together and see what we can do. So when we say the Internet of Things, I think it's great that you, the normal sugared people, uh, you, know, you have your Fitbits, and we think that's adorable. But, but I have uh, you know, an insulin pump, and that insulin pump is plugged in. There's the insulin pump, and it's plugged into my arm. It's 24 hours a day. 
and that talks to a system. Here is a CGM. That is my actual live blood sugar right now. Now you see how it's kicking up there a bit? That's because of stress. <laughs> That's actually plugged in down here in an implant in my side. Sorry to show you my chubbiness. And this is real. When you hear Internet of Things, you think Fitbit and you think Raspberry Pi, but I think this. Okay? And we've plugged this into some cloud systems that I want to share with you. While the Internet of Things is fun, things like Raspberry Pis, this is great, this is a Raspberry Pi, and this is an Internet of Things enabled one, we've actually got some C code on this that is talking to this temperature sensor. So what does that temperature sensor look like? Let me switch over to some code here and show you. This is some C code inside of Visual Studio. This is the low level stuff. C code makes your eyes blur a little bit sometimes. What you need to know, uh, people who are wearing suits, is you've got IoT Hub and you have Azure devices. So the takeaway there is that that's cloud enabled. But for the developers that think this is crazy, I want you to notice that we've actually got a Visual Studio plugin to do remote debugging of things like Raspberry Pis in Visual Studio. So whether it be high level, updating hundreds of thousands of objects, or whether it's low level and doing remote GDB debugging to a Raspberry Pi, we can do that. Now let's talk about my system. <clears throat> Let me bring back to the slides here for a moment. This is overwhelming, it's Azure, right? It's all these icons, what's going on? It's all these people that are doing all of these things. Well, let's talk about me and the system that I'm building. That's me in my shirt. I've got my band. The band goes to Microsoft Health, and that goes ultimately into storage. My glucose system actually goes up into an API, and I pull that data in as well, because that's personal to me. I've got my heart rate over years. I've got my blood sugar over years. What can I do with that? Well, I'm going to show you some visualizations, some graphs. I'm going to plug things into Office and see if Azure Machine Learning can answer some really interesting questions about me and my health. And this is all live, and this is all real. So let's come back over to this machine here. This is a system called Night Scout. This is an open source node application that is running in Azure. And this talks to my CGM, my continuous glucose meter. And I want you to point out a couple of things here. This is the first presentation today. And this is now. That is a real time system that is showing my blood sugar. And one of the things that happens is not just that I drink orange juice, which by the way, I have in case I pass out, uh, but also stress. Stress dumps glucose into the system. And this is just one of the things that I have to deal with when I'm managing my blood sugar. Oh, and actually, I'm not sure if the guy can get a tight shot of that, but this just popped up and it will appear in the, uh, in the cloud. It's warning me that I'm now going high. So in a second, the website is also going to announce, and then I'll get a notification on my band and on my watch, and then people are going to start calling me, and then uh, it'll be scary. <laughs> so, oh, there we go. A notification just showed up. So let's talk about how that notification did, in fact, show up. So I've got a band, and this is some data in the cloud. How do I see that? Well, it turns out that the band can talk some JavaScript. I can take JavaScript out of the band. This is up at developer.microsoftband.com. You may have a band. You may not be a programmer, but you may have a URL that points to some JavaScript or a blog or some XML, and you want to create a tile. I made one for my blood sugar. So now I've got Night Scout on my system, and I can see my blood sugar right there. What's interesting about this is that I can use this visual designer, but I can also look at the manifest directly and look at this. That's the code there. Sugar is high. If it's over 150, notification. And then I'll get a notification on my band. This could be done with a build server, whether you want to water your plants, whatever. That is the personal internet of things, and that's what makes me happy. But let's think about this. Once my blood sugar is in the cloud, what else can I do with it? Well, I can send notifications. My wife can be concerned. She's probably going to be calling in a moment to make sure that I'm OK. But this is part of the process. But remember how I said I want to analyze this stuff in Excel. 
Well, it turns out that I'm not very good at VBA, Visual Basic for Applications, right? Remember that 80% of the world's business logic runs in Excel. I think that's a fact. And uh, in fact, there's an Excel JS API, JavaScript API for Excel. I can write an add-in for Excel in JavaScript using the web technologies that I know how to make. So we went and we made the, uh, the Hansel Sugars project. And I'm going to actually show you some of the code here in just a second. Here we go. Uh, da, 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 da. Where we're going to populate a table in Excel using JavaScript, using web technologies. And what is exciting for this, exciting for me about this, is that I didn't know how to do this before. You see, I'm a web developer. But now I can go in here and put in my target range, hit refresh, and now we're going to go and talk to the backend system and then dynamically populate a chart in Excel of my blood sugar that I could then send to a doctor or my wife. You have to think about the sense of power and enthusiasm that I suddenly have for Excel, which I did not care about before. <laughs> I'm a web developer. That's a web application in the pain there. And it works in Excel online. And one day it'll work in Excel on an iPad. Like, pfft. once you learn how to use one Lego piece, you can then plug them into other stuff. So it's extremely heartening for me to be able to do this. And again, if my blood sugar isn't interesting to you, and it shouldn't be, maybe some hobby of yours or something at work or some uh, inspiration will come into your mind and you'll think about how you can plug these things in together. That's what's so exciting about this. So I've got all my blood sugar in real time. I can collect it into the cloud. Uh, what else can I do with it? Let's switch over to another machine here. I'm going to switch over to a, uh, <clears throat> a Mac. This is a Mac running VS Code. And this particular Mac has got the code to collect my data from the, um, oops, from the health API. Okay? So we're going to go and make RESTful API calls, big standard API calls, off to Microsoft Health, with, which is where the band data is stored. Because this is the thing that's so important. It's my data. It's my heartbeat data. My blood sugar is my data. So once I have that ownership of that data, what can I do with it? I can plug in that data and do different stuff. So let me see if I can jump out of here. This has gone full screen. Full screen can be a little confusing. There we go. I'm going to take that data. I'm going to pull it out of the Microsoft Health API. And this is a storage explorer. The reason I wanted to show you this on a Mac is that this is the Azure Storage Explorer that we've released that is cross-platform. We're looking at the CSV files of my blood sugar data as it's sitting in the cloud. Excuse me, my heart rate data. Pardon me. I'm going to hit download. I'm going to throw that on the desktop. Watch the right side. Now I have power. Now I have control. Now I've got a hold of that, and I can run an analysis on it. Now in this case, I just brought it down to the desktop. I could do some test notification about my blood sugar. Um, I've got, uh, and I can do some analysis here, but maybe I want to do that analysis in a more sophisticated way. When you start thinking about the Internet of Things, you start thinking about huge amounts of data. I said it has my heart rate. Well, like how much is that? Well, I mean, is it an average over a minute, over five minutes, over hours? This is a huge amount of data. My blood sugar is doing three or 400 data sets every single day over the course of a year. This adds up to huge amounts of information. This is where simply putting it into Excel and sorting and going, eh, it looks like a pattern, isn't going to be enough for me. I'm going to need to do some machine learning. I want to find out about why does my blood sugar go up? when I'm stressed out? What does Thanksgiving dinner look like? Maybe I can answer those questions with uh, machine learning. So I'm going to switch back over to uh, this, uh, this system here. And uh, what, I've, what I'm going to do is I'm going to jump into here. This is a machine learning kind of algorithm that I've put together, an experiment, if you will, to pull in data from the heart rate on the right there from Azure Storage and the glucose data. And I'm going to come up with a stress index. I'm inventing a number. It's the Hanselman Stress Index. And we're going to load that data up. And what we're going to do is clean it up, do a little bit of normalization, 
do a couple of analysis, run some statistics, and then come up with a data set that the result is going to be a time-based data set of my stress. Okay, so that's kind of interesting. Um, it's pretty powerful though, that, uh, but I need to see it over time. So how would I express this over time and what value is there in it? Well, there is this API in Office 365 and all of Microsoft called the Graph API, right? The Microsoft Graph, graph.microsoft.com. And this allows me to pull my information. Remember how I kept stressing, it's my, my blood sugar and my heart rate and my calendar and my email. I want a unified API to go and get those things. And the Graph API, and you can see there at graph.microsoft.com, allows me to make those requests. So what if we looked at my blood sugar and my stress and my heart rate over time overlaid on an Office 365 calendar. That could give us some insights. And again, I don't know anything about this stuff. This is what's so important and why as a developer this is so exciting. I know JavaScript, I know the web, I know C Sharp, and now I'm feeling comfortable about the cloud. But when I say, when I see, hey, this is an, an API and it uses JavaScript and I can access all of the graph data in Microsoft, that's amazing. That's, that's a playground of excitement. So I can go and build this get a start date and an end date. This is all standard parsing of JSON, parsing of JavaScript, all using the Graph API. Let's go and see what kind of a question that that could potentially answer. So here is my calendar, the stress index as it applies to calendar data. Let's click on one. This is all real. Okay, so here's gl glucose is updating. I can see the different rehearsals and I can see heart rate and sugar and stress changing. I can actually run queries and see the result of that machine learning and ask the really burning question, the question that we all have, which is what is the most stressful person in my life that is causing these problems and raising my blood sugar? <laughs> Darn. It is a really, really great time to be a developer. I can put stuff like this together now. It is an extremely personal time. It is an extremely empowering time. You know how we keep telling everyone, you know, teach the kids how to code. Everyone needs to learn how to code. That's a part of it. But we need to teach people how to think about systems, and how to plug stuff in. I don't know the Graph API, but it made sense because it's using open web technologies. I don't know a lot of open source systems, but I'm learning those libraries and I'm bringing them in because they're using open tech. .NET is open source. If I have questions, I can look at the docs, but I can also read the source. Maybe I want to run a Mac. Maybe I want an iPhone. I can build those systems with the mobile tools in Visual Studio. Maybe I want to run on Ubuntu. Then I can use Visual Studio Code and I can write Angular and I can use Go. I can run those things in the Azure cloud. It is such an exciting and powerful time to be a developer right now. I really hope that you have as much fun building stuff as we have had building this stuff for you. And I really look forward to seeing what you all can build. Thank you very much and have a really great day.